Hey everyone, uh, we're going to get started. We have one speaker that's having a few challenges uh, getting in, but the no issues. We'll just introduce her when she arrives. Um, I'd like to kick things off. You already know who Angela Mondu is, but she's here to moderate Hi. our first panel today. So, Hello. I'm here this time and um, this time on time. Uh, amazing. We are definitely having some tech challenges today. But anyways, here we are for our first panel, Upskilling and Reskilling for the Future. We have some incredible speakers today. We're joined by Sean Hinton, co-founder at Sky Hive. You already heard me talk a little bit about that. We'll hear a lot more from Sean. Kira Graham, learning strategist at D2L from my home away from home in Kitchener-Waterloo. Kira, I used to hang out a lot with um, people from D2L, just so, that, just so you know. Tony Holmes, practice lead for solutions architects in the private sector with Pluralsight. So super excited to have you guys here talking about, like I said, a really um, what I think is mission critical discussion for Canada. We're gonna hear about themes today on new skilling, e-learning technology, um, small medium enterprise preparedness, and the importance of an agile future workforce. But we all know now that our workforce, uh, as we speak, is changing rapidly. Education is clearly a critical component and foundation to all that we're doing to rapidly accelerate technology. Um, and some of the big enterprises out there are really um, wrapping their heads around quickly around how to get people skilled so that they can move ahead. We've got Google with their own certificate programs, Microsoft, Shopify University. I think we're going to hear from them as well. So lots going on in terms of determining ways within an education system, but also within the business world on how to ramp up um, our future skills and reskilling and, and e-learning and all of those capabilities that we need to get talent and skills um, up and running. So certainly uh, excited to hear from our panelists. I see Wendy has joined us. So welcome, Wendy. Good to see you here. And I'm going to start with some introductions for all of you. Now, I am going to give you some um, time limits, everybody, just because I have to. We have 40 minutes or so and lots of great speakers. I do want to start with a really quick, give each of you kind of 60 seconds to tell us what your title is. Um, but more importantly, what is it as quickly as you can that you think is the absolute power behind what you do or what your organization does? Okay, 60 seconds if you can, maybe 90. And uh, why don't we start with Tony? As a surprise. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name's Tony Holmes. I work for Pluralsight. We're a technology skills company who help uh, organizations, uh, both government and private sector, upskill and reskill their employees. We use artificial intelligence um, to, to help do that. And I think um, probably the most important thing that we do with organizations is we help you, uh, we, we help organizations implement a culture of learning and a continuous learning methodology and provide artificial intelligence to understand skills learning gaps and provide content in order to fill those skills learning gaps. So we meet the learner where they are at the level that they're at. And we provide them a directed path to mastery with only the skill gaps that they need to fill. That that sounds actually um, very, very relevant, but super interesting. I want to talk to you more about that. Um, how about Sean? Sean, I like your look today. Cool Thank ball you. cap. Um, <laughs> thanks, Angela. So I'm Sean. I'm founder and CEO of Skyhive. We're based in Vancouver. Uh, but we serve uh, Fortune 500 Global 2000 organizations and governments uh, around the world, so now on, on four continents. Um, we have uh, invented a methodology called quantum labor analytics, which is the application of artificial intelligence to analyze a workforce at its most granular level. A workforce could be a, a company, it could be a community, or it could be a country. Um, the, the power of Skyhive is evolving the way in which we, um, we, we use data uh, to make decisions around workforce development. And so um, the power of Skyhive drives uh, both reskilling at scale, 
which is a big challenge. Reskilling and isolation mm -hmm. is 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 something we've done traditionally. Reskilling at scale and speed is the challenge. In addition to um, recognizing that reskilling is both an, uh, the combination of art and science. And so technology can only take us so far. It's the practitioners, the HR professionals, the learning and development professionals, academia that that uh, truly bring efficacy to reskilling. So thank you for having That's me excellent. today. Yeah, thank you. Great, great intro. I love the combination of the art and science and the scale and speed, which is uh, like a non-negotiable, I think, going forward. Thanks, Sean. Um, Wendy, welcome. So much, Angela. Sorry, I was teaching till the last second. Um, so my name is Wendy Sukir. I'm a prophet Ryerson, and I head the Diversity Institute. And I think that our um, our uh, focus is really on using evidence to um, help define, assess, develop, and utilize skills. And so we're really focused on ensuring that uh, people aren't being trained for imaginary jobs, but also that uh, employers aren't looking for skills in all the wrong places. Because from our perspective, it's lack of evidence-based approaches that are really contributing to the skills gaps. And we spend a lot of time looking at how we can harness what we know about innovation processes. And so that includes uh, utilizing technology where it's appropriate, but also thinking about um, alternative pathways in, to, in order to really uh, drive change in the ecosystem. That's um, thanks for that, Wendy. I think all of you have such interesting backgrounds. I don't think we're going to have enough time in, in 45 minutes, but um, I like harnessing what you know about innovation as well to drive the, the skills needs. So that's really, really, um, I think very, very relevant. And last but not least, Kira, are you in Kitchener Waterloo by any chance, Kira, or, just, or probably not? Because we're all remote, right? <laughs> I'm not. I'm in. I'm in St. Catharines. I. Uh, I'm a remote employee for D2L. Um, even outside of the the current context where everybody is remote. All right. Um, so I'm a learning strategy consultant at D2L, and. Uh, I think most people are familiar with D2L um, in terms of our learning platform. So we're we're working through our learning platform to transform how people access education, um, make it more accessible for anyone, anytime, anywhere. Um, and we're constantly engaging with education, workforce, and policy leaders in conversations about building a truly resilient learning system that helps people to develop the skills that they need to be successful um, in the jobs of the future and how our learning systems can be more equitable to make sure that education and opportunity are accessible to everyone. And specifically, the work that I do with D2L is on the strategic side. So I work with our customers as undergoing these large-scale digital transformations to support them through the, the change management aspect of their, of their transformations. Thanks, Kira. You must be a busy person. That's all I can say because there must be a lot of companies out there, including our government, um, going through a tremendous amount of digital transformation. So good to hear from all of you. Really look forward to this discussion. I'm going to kick it off with you, Sean, if you could set the stage for us. What is reskilling and upskilling, and what is the distinction between them? I think there's a lot of focus on 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 the terminology around reskilling or or, or upskilling. Um, reskilling would be taking someone who um, is is maybe being displaced and uh, having a look at their skill set and moving them into what we call proximity career pathways. So you know, taking a, a frontline customer service person, um, automation's coming in. You know, the, the frontline customer service is now uh, being automated and made redundant. And how do you move them into a, a digital marketing role, for example? That that would be reskilling. Upskilling would be, you know, having somebody in a, a stream, in a career path, and providing them with this, the additional skills to move from, let's say, a supervisor to a, a manager or a, a level four to a level three uh, in an organization. That, that would be my definition um, of upskilling versus reskilling. 
good. That's a good definition that provides a lot of clarity for me. And so, Sean, just to amplify a little bit about that, I'm sure then from the um, movement perspective or transformation perspective, there's some difference in terms of how you approach reskilling versus upskilling. Percent, because it, it also it, it also matters where in in the, the the skill level somebody is. So we see, for example, with lower skilled uh, you know frontline workers, that the way in which they go on their learning journey is very different than a data scientist who's picking up a new you know a new sort of application or a, a cloud engineer who's trying to learn the next uh, you know the next piece of AWS, for example. Right. Um, there, there requires a lot more sort of human intervention, coaching, mentorship um, on, on the lower skilled pathways. And so definitely very different in the way you approach it. Good. That's really good information. Certainly um, um, in our work as well at Tech Nation, we're working with partners who are um, working in that displaced worker space and trying to transition. In my old world as well, um, transitioning military veterans from that world into the business world in many different um, professions. So pretty fascinating um, space to be looking at. So what I wanna um, transition to um, on the same topic, but what are the key elements of a successful upskilling or reskilling program? And after just hearing from you, Sean, sounds like they might be a little different. Um, and Wendy, maybe you could kind of kick off for us what you think there, and then Tony, you could step in as well and give us your sense. Um, employment, you know, so okay. I'm really preoccupied with outcomes. And so from my point of view, is reskilling job, uh, program successful if the graduates get real jobs? And an upskilling um, program is successful if people keep their jobs. So we've got lots of, you know, we've got okay. the ROI and lots of the large scale transformations that AT&T and others have undertaken, where instead of, you know, getting rid of employees that they don't feel meet their needs, they've invested in, in starting from where employers are, employees are and figuring out how to move them up the curve. Um, and we've also worked a lot with, you know, groups like Empower and, of course, our own ADAPT program, where we're focused on finding people alternative pathways into highly paid jobs. But for me, you know, if it works, if people have employment and if employers are happy, those are kind of the key things we have to look at. Yeah. And then, Tony, along the same lines, and then you may, maybe have an AI angle behind that kind of upskilling and reskilling differences as well. But what are your thoughts on successful programming to support both of those those spaces? So I think may, maybe um, I, I, I potentially look at things a little bit differently. So one of the one of the things we have to bear in mind, it's something that Sean mentioned earlier is that AI and automation and robotics are going to completely change the way we view the world. So they're going to continue to displace traditional tasks and the way we do them. And they're going to displace jobs and workers. And we're going to have to adapt to that. So the half-life of skills and roles and even careers are going to change significantly. And that, that the time periods that we work with these roles are going to shrink significantly. So... When we train people, when we reskill them, when we upskill them, what we're actually trying to do is we're trying to train them and lead them towards roles that we potentially haven't even envisioned yet. We're going to be okay. recruiting for roles in five years that don't even exist right now. OK, and that's going to continuously emerge and evolve. And those roles are going to expire again themselves. So I think one of the things we have to take into account is breadth, breadth and the ability to be. Um, to, to be adaptive. So I think to some extent, it's those that can adapt the most with a breadth of skills that are going to help our organizations achieve their missions and, and kind of change with, with the organization. So I guess for, from my perspective, what I'm looking for in a successful implementation of a program like this are very much individualist technologists so if you like modern day renaissance people that are, are skilled have, have a very broad base of skills that they can bring to bear and they can 
de dig into depth whenever their role changes or whenever they need to pivot to do another job like we used to um back in the good old days when there were cyber security roles the cyber security guy used to be a systems administrator and he had to wear different hats and he brought this breadth to the role. And I think we're going to have to kind of take that approach to most of our technology jobs. The, the cybersecurity guy is going to be something of an AI guy. He's also going to be something of a networking guy. He's also going to be something of a cloud guy because all of these things are coming together as a, a, as a huge changing environment for us. Might not be a guy. I, 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 I apologize. Hey, girl. <laughs> you just said something actually um, – so my brother's visiting and he's got these VR goggles. And so I jumped in there to do some gaming with them, but then they were doing flight training. He's actually a pilot and does some simulation training in these goggles. There you go. They look exactly like that, Sean. And it made me realize to your point that we can't even envision. I think the whole world is going to start becoming very virtual and internally driven from a work perspective as well. And um, you just hit the, I think, the nail on the head there that we don't know what we don't know yet in a, in a lot of ways. So I want to um, shift a little bit. And Kira, I'd like you to jump in here. How do you think we'll see the relationship between IT and HR departments change in the future? One of you mentioned earlier, the art, I think it was Sean, the art and the science and the need for both um, in terms of where we're heading from a skilling perspective. What are your thoughts, Kira? So I think that as HR becomes more and more reliant on technology to do things like track performance, um, to, to provide learning and development opportunities, I think we're seeing these departments become more and more entwined. And I think in particular data is really increasingly critical for HR departments to understand gaps and to push out learning to address those gaps and to understand how or if their interventions are having the impact or the outcome that they're hoping for. And even just with the customers that I work with today, I am increasingly seeing HR departments that have their own data analysts or an IT person embedded right into the department because data and technology are, are really mission critical at this point for learning and development in HR. Okay, I like that answer. It's um, funnily enough, I'm just telling you about my brother who's here visiting and he's uh, working with the whole training strategy for these pilots coming in. And um, they're talking about implementing an LMS and trying to pitch that to their uh, leadership team. And I was saying, you, you have to have it. You've got to have the data, the real-time data on the credentials and the training and the upskilling and all of these ongoing certifications that are required. So um, good points that you made there for us, Kira. Thank you. Um, okay, let's talk a little bit. Um, we've been talking about it a lot. I think more and more where it's going to become such a big part of our lives. AI, machine learning, um, and helping ensure that we have a skilled and agile workforce in that space. So, uh, Sean and Tony, maybe if you guys don't mind jumping in on that one for us, Sean. Angela, just wanted to clarify the question. Are, are you talking about building an, an AI workforce? How is it um, AI and machine learning helping ensure, yeah, that we have that skilled uh, and agile workforce? So in the case of the I LMI, think... go ahead, sorry, it sounds like you get it. <laughs> Yeah, so um, I, I think just just you know on a macro scale, when I when I talk about quantum labor analytics, it, it it's exactly that. It's it's going through the process of automation, but dealing with disparate data sets that are are beginning to pop up and form. So, for example, in the in the world of workforce development, we have sentiment analysis, psychometric assessment, learning and uh, learning content, learning development. We have credentials, we have labor market data. Just like any automation process, when you mm -hmm. start to bring those things together, you start to provide a system of intelligence and a layer of automation that is taking what used to take 100% of time with respect to competency profiling, competency mapping, going out and getting that, that uh, subject matter expertise and bringing all of that together in a very arduous workforce planning process, that is becoming automated. And so now the artists, um, the, the practitioners, can focus on how do you evolve the human conversation? How do you evolve 
processes that in many cases, as it relates to workforce planning are, are decades old, and that we can be bringing in all of these new insights and analytics to the way in which we're helping people and companies transform through this period of time. That's really, um, uh, it's something that I kind of grapple with because some of the work we're doing now is focused around national occupation codes. And I keep wondering, like, aren't they going to be obsolete before we, you know, get them documented and credentialed? So that it's kind of an interesting, um, goes back to that. We don't know what we don't know. And we're moving so fast that, uh, better be here than back there. Right. And Tony, what are your thoughts as well on the, on that question. So that, that brings me something you just said as well, which brings me to to something that that I'm I, I am actually very interested in. So uh, there's a there's a philosopher called N Nassim Taleb who wrote a, a, a set of books called uh, the Inserto series. Anyway, uh, long story short, one of the statements that he makes is when we're faced with things that we don't know or we don't understand or we can't grapple with. What we tend to do is we tend to try and label and containerize and fit this this un, yeah. ungrapplable knowledge, if you like, is that a new word? Um, and, and try and kind of fit it into specific categories so we can understand it. So we as humans can feel more comfortable with it. So I think that's that's absolutely right. I think we try and label these roles and we try and label this skill progression and we try and label all these things to make ourselves feel comfortable. But again, going back to what we don't know, what we don't know, we don't know what's coming three years down the road. You know, how much bearing do those labels have? So that's why what, what we've done at, uh, at, at Pluralsight is we've tried to uh, apply artificial intelligence, much like Sean has with the problems that he's addressing by trying to understand what people don't know. So we apply the artificial intelligence to understand where people's skill gaps lie, because we understand that training is a long and arduous process for some people. And historically, people haven't had a chance to decide when they do the training. L&D says, you do this training and this is when you do it. And it's not always timely and it's not always relevant to our role. So what we've tried to do is we've tried to understand where skill gaps are, and compress that time with micro learning so someone can take 30 or 45 minutes out of their day to close a particular skill gap. We can address that skill gap. The person can come away with knowledge that is timely. It is useful to what they do today. And, and what it does is it compresses that time to learning and it makes it much more relevant. So to your question, Angela, that's exactly how we're addressing the unknown unknowns because we think it's something vitally important because we don't have time to send people on half a dozen week long training courses and hope that they get enough of it that they can bring it back to be useful to their to their day to day roles. Or even longer. OK, I just want to do a little break and ask about that beautiful little dog on Sean's lap. <laughs> what is that? <laughs> Mine is uh, an, um, 11 week, an 11 week old golden doodle. Oh my God. I wanted to get a, well, I don't think it's going to be a little dog, but I have a puppy that's eight months old and she's 70 pounds. Now she's not sitting on my lap anymore. So, um, okay. So we're going to grappleize with the unknown unknowns. And I, I do like that word. You've just started a new word for this, this conversation. Okay. So I want to talk a little bit about, um, so we have a couple of leaders here. We have all of you leaders, but in terms of huge learning platforms, I want to talk to Kira and Wendy about this one. Can you both um, share a time in your career where you had a moment where you felt invigorated by, and I'm sure both of you are going to have something exciting to tell us, but by the work that your organizations are doing. So maybe we'll start with you, Wendy, and then over to you, Kira. And Kira, for some reason, every time you talk, you go gray, but we can see you when you're not talking. <laughs> so, you know, I think the work that we're doing uh, for the Future Skills Center, looking at um, how, to, how to drive change and how to um, identify alternative pathways for people who otherwise are often overlooked because of very uh, restrictive and unimaginative definitions of what jobs and skills and so on are. Um, I think that for me is really interesting. And as I said, you know, using technology to support it is, is, is helpful. But, you know, if you can take a graduate in fine arts and turn them into a data analytics specialist in a week and get them a job, that's yeah. the kind of stuff that I find interesting. If you can take an inner city kid 
and put them through a four month work integrated learning program with wraparound support and actually get them an entry level position at Accenture. That for me is exciting. If you can take a, you know, someone with a master's degree in computer science from Pakistan who's working as a security guard or an Uber driver and get them a job at Cognizant um, after putting them through a, a short intensive training program. That's where I think the real opportunities are. And I think there are massive uh, ways in which we can use technology to create those pathways. But that's way more exciting to me than, for example, helping a graduate um, co-op computer science from Waterloo get a job, because obviously they're going to anyways. Yeah, yeah, that's that's great to hear and, and an incredible program, Wendy. Thanks for sharing that. Um, Kira, over to you. So I think for me, um, there's one particular moment that, that stands out that that reminded me of why we do what we do every day at D2L. And that moment for me was we were I was at our user conference, D2L's user conference fusion in 2019. And we had the opportunity to hear directly from one of the participants in a program that had been developed um, by a couple of our customers working in partnership. And so one of the things that D2L has been really focused on over the past few years is facilitating partnerships between workforce and education partners when it comes to these upskilling and reskilling initiatives. And for us, we, we found that to be something that we could help facilitate because we work with customers in both sectors. So it felt like a natural position for us to be able to bring them together. And so what we were hearing about um, at, at our conference that year was there was a collaboration between the University of Memphis and FedEx, and it was delivered on our uh, platform. And we were hearing directly from uh, Joe Kelly, who is a frontline manager at FedEx. And it was incredible to hear directly from one of the learners in these programs, because so often our involvement as a technology vendor, as a service provider, it's at the front end, right? Working with our customers to develop and deliver these programs. But hearing directly from Joe was really moving. He told us about, he had promised his mother that he would graduate from college. Life got in the way. He ended up in this job at, at FedEx. He had worked his way into a frontline manager position. He could not progress any further because he didn't have a, a college degree. Um, his mother had passed away and he felt like he had never, you know, made good on his promise to her. Um, but it, they, when they introduced this life program, he was able to work towards fulfilling that promise. He graduated exactly one year to the day that that program launched at FedEx. And so this for me really just hammered home the transformative power of education. And it reminded me of why, why we do this to hear directly from someone at the, at the, at the learner side who had had this transform his, his life and who had been able to achieve something he had not thought he would be able to achieve. And I think um, just listening to all of you, we're barely at the forefront of this whole movement for transformation of skills and um, industries that need to be completely reskilled. So it's just the beginning of a such a powerful um, place to be in terms of tech and, and the readiness of, of Canada for for uh, all of the reskilling and upskilling. Um, on this, a similar note, and, and I heard one of you talk a little bit about this. So if we start talking about micro education or 45 minute windows in your work day or different ways of learning and education, how do, and any of you can jump in on this, how do you think, because I know right now my brain hurts because I'm switching gears so much all day long on, on a virtual mode. How can we as humans um, manage that chopping and changing from work to learning to work? And what is the um, expertise all of you have in, in, in terms of that in, in getting the best out of that kind of strategy for upskilling and reskilling? And why don't we go back to Tony? Haven't heard you for a bit. And I'd love to hear from each of you on your thoughts in that space. Yeah, so that's that's a really interesting question. One of the things, again, that I'll go back to is the culture of learning. So I think one of the things that you just highlighted, Angela, is is the the concept that we are chopping and changing. We're saying, here's your job. 
And now when you've done your job, you're going to go away and do some learning that's relevant to your job. And then tomorrow you're going to come back and do your job. And we're not making time for learning. And what we actually see is the most high performance organizations have this top down culture of learning from the very top at the CEO all the way through the leadership. They're given permission to learn. We're being they're, they're telling the people that are working in their organizations. Learning is important. It's important to our culture. It's important to the jobs that we do because you're technologists and technologists have to continually learn. So what we're actually finding is when you're having to switch gears and you're actually having to sit there and understand, well, now I'm doing my job, but this is separate from my job. It, it's kind of like that the two things are disconnected and they're absolutely not. So in implementing this culture of learning, giving people permission to learn, providing a room away from their actual day job where maybe they can get up and take a mental break for an hour and actually use learning to kind of refresh their palate and clear their head and just do some of these tasks that they want to do that have been identified. So I think that's probably the biggest thing to understand. Culture of learning from the top down where we actually say learning is a part of your job as a technologist. It's not something adjacent to your job. It's not something additional to your job. It is actually a part of who you are as a technologist. And I think that's probably a, a really important way that we can start to head that off. And in fact, only about 30% of companies right now and organizations have a culture of learning or are approaching a culture of learning within their organizations. Yeah. And, you know, I bet you they're the larger companies. So when we're looking at the world of SMEs who um, can be challenged already with the technology acceleration and adoption, adding this kind of um, culture is an additional strain. Um, certainly that we'll have to think about right in the small, medium enterprise. Anybody else want to add to that? See you later. You should be listening to this. <laughs> That's my brother who should be learning more about technology and learning management systems. Um, so yeah, anybody else have any other thoughts on that topic? So culture is a big one because that in itself can be change management, right? Yeah, yeah. I would, um, I, I, I would, my, my concern is around efficacy. So we've seen this explosion over the last five years of self-directed learning. There are millions of pieces of content. And if we take the simple problem of call it, let, let's let's uh, make it analogous to the Netflix algorithm, where you know there were inherent oh, yeah. issues with the algorithm that were presenting Netflix originals, blockbuster movies, etc., and a whole bunch of content that would be individualized to a particular viewer was going unnoticed. One of the things that we haven't learned yet in the world is how do we use digital learning how do we couple that with hybrid learning because as as i had mentioned earlier that's going to be required for a huge 80 percent plus of the workforce and how do we actually understand the learning type um, some people are yeah. visual learners some people have uh, disabilities some people have different uh, you know they want to learn in a team environment etc i believe we are at our absolute infancy in terms of understanding this. Um, so absolutely agree with Tony on, on the culture of learning. That's step one. It's like, here's a space that you can come in and, and, and learn. But now it's about challenging us in this space to define efficacy. Have you actually seen a person go through a reskilling journey and come out the other side with a higher income, with more uh, opportunities, and in a way that's leaving the company productive and continuing to grow in the direction that it needs to. And we're at our infancy in this stage. So it's gonna be an, an exciting five years ahead of us in terms of all of us coming together and figuring out how we actually, how we actually do this. Yeah, good, really interesting. Wendy, thoughts? No, can see, there we go. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think um, efficacy is really part of what I was trying to get at, which is what are the outcomes? What's the impact? I think the other thing, and we did a report, I stuck it in the chat with Deloitte, just doing a scan of the technologies that are currently being used to assess skills, develop skills, the learning management systems, et cetera, et cetera, that are out there. And one of the things that I think is challenging in the current environment is the fragmentation and the reinvention of the wheel and the lack of um, portability, you know, so one of, I'm very interested in the work that eCampus Ontario and others are doing around micro-credentials and trying to develop more um, 
more ways of of porting things from one place to the other because as Sean said you know there's big difference between sitting in on a three-hour excel workshop and and actually being able to do anything and with there's often an assumption that people who have gone through a learning experience have learned something and we know that that's not a really good assumption so I'm really interested in work that's being done on frameworks, competency assessments, how we actually um, try to remove bias from some of the systems that are, are in place. Because as was mentioned, um, sometimes the assumptions about what it required, what is required to actually do a job effectively are based on people looking in the mirror and figuring whoever does the job next needs to be just like them. And I think there's a lot of ways that we can use intelligence, whether it's artificial or human, to, to improve the system. That's a good concept, human and, and artificial. Um, and Kira, you were nodding your head, so I think you had some key points you wanted to share with us. I, I, I really just agree with everything that's been said so far. I think um, in terms of the work that I do with clients, um, one of the things that, that Tony mentioned around creating this learning culture and a space for learning um, for, for me and the change management work that I do with my clients, that, that comes down to executive sponsorship. And if that's missing, if there isn't that support at the executive level for learning, then everything, every other effort is, is not going to be successful because you haven't created the right environment for it to be successful. So one of the things um, that, that oftentimes I think is missing in a lot of organizations is the chief learning officer. I think it's very rare to see that right now. Learning gets lumped into HR and instead of called out as its own area that is important and, and needs a space at, at the executive level at the table. Um, and I think when it's not at the table that, that, that it doesn't necessarily send the right message or create the right environment about the importance of learning. And then to, to pick up a bit on what Sean was saying around um, you know, having the the right content and the right algorithms and having having the right things appear. I think I think that's one of the other pieces of the puzzle. So once you create that space for learning, you need to have the ability to surface the right content at the right moment for the right person to have that impact that you're hoping to have. So to achieve those outcomes um, that that Wendy was talking about earlier, you need to you need to be able to identify who needs the learning and when do they need it and what does that look like and i have some customers doing some really interesting work in that space i have one customer where they've created an integration between their performance management dashboard and their their learning management system and so what happens is when performance drops below a certain area in a, in a given category and what they've determined to be an appropriate learning intervention would then be triggered to enroll a specific learner. And they've created a set of criteria so that, you know, the, the content is really as targeted as possible so that if, for example, someone's already taken that content, they're not going to get recommended the same content again, just because that's the piece that's associated with the performance area that maybe they need to work on. So really trying to identify and build these algorithms around identifying what will best achieve the outcome that you're looking for. Hmm. So much stuff to think about here. Um, all great insight from all of you. Um, now I want to switch gears a little bit. And this this is a, a space that we at Tech Nation are heavily focused on. And that's an issue for Canada, which is our small, medium enterprises and accelerating technology adoption in that space. We have a need. Um, I'm going to talk tomorrow at an event just totally focused on that and Accenture had shared some great numbers with us that a 1% increase in digitization of the small medium enterprise in Canada would impact our GDP by half a percent. Like the impact is huge. So the challenges and the barriers for SMEs are resources, time, focused on getting deals. How do we and I'd like each of you maybe to take a minute or two and then we'll probably wrap up there. But let's land on the small medium enterprise in Canada. How can we support the resources, lack of resources, barriers, and enable um, this real critical adoption um, in terms of our human capital 
to support the technology. So um, maybe I'll start with you, Sean, if you don't mind, and we'll, we'll just go around the table. Yeah, so we've we've actually had some, um, having continued to have some very successful partnerships um, because one of the, in, in the early days of Skyhive, I was very focused on, on SMEs because I wanted to ensure that everything we were building was very focused on, on SMEs for um, the, the fact that we're a B corporation. We, we want to be inclusive of the entire labor market. And so we've learned through a, a number of different initiatives and partnerships that a consortium approach to this is it, like at the industry association level, very similar, you know, with Tech Nation, is is the approach yeah. to actually having sustainable change. So uh, one of the recent uh, uh, engagements we're, we're partnered with is uh, uh, manufacturing in Eastern Ontario, supporting 400 organizations, SMEs, um, through the industry association with um you know reskilling at scale and that's one of the pieces i talk about when i define reskilling at scale um you can't just go in with a technology um or or you know into a, a 40 person company and expect to see lasting sustainable change it has to be a commitment at a at a regional you know or consortium level so that 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 has been our experience so I love that. So you um, are you providing programs, Sean, to consortiums that can then all SMEs can tap into? Is that kind of the strategy for the scale? Yeah, exactly. OK, yeah. perfect. OK, that's awesome. And um, how about you, Tony? Um, I think uh, I, I think it's it's really going to come back to and, uh, you know, apologies for repeating myself, but SMEs, small, small and medium businesses are in a much better position to implement that culture of learning than our big organizations. So one of the first things that makes it, it gives you a head start, if you like, because you're far more flexible as an SME, is you can actually start to build that culture of learning far easier than these big orgs. So, for example, personalizing development plans using artificial intelligence technologies like the ones we've already mentioned from Sean and indeed our platform makes no differentiation between whether you're an individual or whether you're an organization in the majority of what we do. Create accountability from the top down. Almost all of the organizations that are high performing, whether they're small or large, have um, have accountability from the top down of people demonstrating that that learning culture. And more importantly, perhaps, they use their learning culture to attract new talent. So, for example, the, the, the culture of learning then becomes a part of their hiring process, part of their recruitment process, because they're looking for other people that are lifelong learners to come on board with this great learning journey of theirs. And they also make time for learning. And whilst that doesn't sound like you know, we, we can't afford to lose our employees away from their desks for for however many, ha, however much time. What happens if you don't train them? What happens if they're not improving their skills and getting better at what they do? The the, the important thing to remember is that um, high performance organizations are five times more likely, no matter what their size, to have a learning culture in place. They're three times more likely to hold leaders accountable for demonstrating how important learning is to the organization. And they're three times more likely to use the learning culture in recruiting. So it's it's a great buzzword. And I know our whole world is filled with buzzwords at the moment. But, you know, let's take a step back. It's not that difficult to implement if you take a if you take a planned approach towards implementing that. And again, SMEs are in a much better position to do that than large orgs. I totally agree with you about the SMEs. They have that capability, right? They're more agile. Sounds like the large organizations you're talking about was the one I used to belong to, which is the military. <laughs> but honestly, you talk about culture, top down, accountability. Those are some pretty important principles and very important for agile and rapid change. So it, it makes a lot of sense in terms of what you're saying. Um, Kira, and we'll land on Wendy. Um, so so I would just say that over the past year, the majority of the customers that I've worked with have been small or medium sized businesses. It's been a, a huge shift from prior to the pandemic to where we are today. And I think part of that is because a lot of, as, as Tony was saying, a lot of those smaller organizations are able to pivot more quickly. So when it comes to, to deciding to, to change the way that they approach their, their learning, they don't have this very rigidly structured learning 
learning function at this point in time where, you know, this is how we do things, this is how we've always done things, they're, they're a little bit more flexible to be able to change more quickly. And so one of the things we've done at D2L to better support these customers is that we've built in um, the learning strategy support. So the services that my team provides, we've built that into every single new implementation that we provide now so that those customers who may not necessarily have those roles in-house can still receive that support through their implementation. That's fantastic. That's that's probably going to be a really good business um, model for you, for business um, for TV and product. Great. And then I'm going to land on Wendy from SME perspective, enabling the SME. Yeah, I think it's, uh, you know, not all SMEs are created equally and you have to take a sectoral perspective. So ICT related SMEs have a really different trajectory. We know that prior to COVID, 30% of companies in Ontario, SMEs, did not have an internet presence. So one of the things COVID's really done is accelerate digitization and programs like Digital Main Street and so on, which focus on, on technology adoption, have been invaluable. Unfortunately, a lot of SMEs still lack capacity internally to use and continue to grow the, the application of technology. So um, a couple of things. First off, we have to ensure that the, the federal government, especially skill strategy, doesn't just meet the needs of large companies. And if you look at who's around the table on a lot of their skills round tables, the SMEs are not there, even though they account for most of the jobs. So I think making sure people understand that startups and SMEs need to be part of the skills agenda, and we need to look at incentivizing investment and training in a number of ways. You know, tax credits, things like that can happen, help, but the building shared platforms, trying to develop economies of scale, curating tools and and content, I think is really important. And we have a partnership with the Ontario Chamber of Commerce, for example, and a number of the other provincial chambers, as well as with Magnet and others, to try to start to build out some shared basic services, because we can't afford not to uh, continue innovation in our SMEs, and they're hurting really badly as a result of uh, COVID. Yeah, it's uh, there's a call to action in terms of all of us as thought leaders, consortiums, associations, platform um, developers, I think, in terms of influencing that space for Canada. So if you guys have some time tomorrow, you can join us on our Tech for Canada discussion. Um, it's all about that. Very concerned about that space. And we'll have to really harness that topic as part of this. So there you have it, everybody. Um, an amazing panel. We have some funny little noise in the background, but I want to thank all of you. Sean, I didn't ask you the name of your dog. I thanks for your dog for participating as well. But here you here you have it from Sean Hinton, co-founder at, at Skyhive. We have Tony Holmes, practice lead, solution architects at um, Pluralsight, Kira Graham, learning strategist at Desire to Learn D2L, and Wendy Couquet uh, from um, sorry, Wendy, it says to say Sukye, right? I pronounced your name wrong. Sorry about that from um, our uh, director at Ryerson Diversity Institute. Thanks, everyone. It was awesome having you here. Hey, I think uh, I think right across Canada, we're all in the afternoon now. So I'll just wish everyone a, a good afternoon. We'll come back. Um, I won't take up too much time here, but just wanted to offer everybody a, a huge sincere thank you on behalf of Tech Nation. Thank you to all of our speakers. So many members and community partners came together to, to put this event uh, into place last week and this week. It's been phenomenal. Today was was incredible. I learned so much again. And just like I said last week, you know, I, I know that I've I've learned something. And I know that in a, sorry, I know in an event, I know in an event is is successful when I can really physically feel the wheels turning, and I've got lots of ideas and and flowing, and um, and there's just so much excitement over what we're doing, and uh, we're very fortunate to have so many fantastic leaders in our network who who again came came together. So thank you uh, to, again to all of our speakers and moderators. If anyone is feeling uh, you know excited or electric as I am, I will the open. The networking function is open, so uh, I encourage you to connect with other folks, have a cup of coffee, have a glass of wine, glass of water, whatever you need. 
And uh, we'll see you uh, hopefully next year and uh, enjoy the rest of Will Month and take care.